Hello everyone, this is Robert with Sparkfun Electronics, and this is the second video of our robotic video series, and today we're going to be talking about angular motion. Angular motion can be as simple as rotating a wheel to drive a robot, or rotating some kind of lever or arm, or even like spinning a rotisserie chicken. There's a lot of different ways that you can apply angular motion to your robotic project. Motors convert electricity into mechanical power. They come in various shapes, sizes, and configurations. Brush motors are the workhorse of robotics and industry. They have a very good torque response curve with a wide RPM range. They're very simple to control, requiring only two leads to be connected to a battery or power source. As the name would suggest, they have brushes. These brushes translate power to a ring called the commutator. This commutator is essentially the controller of a brush motor, supplying current to the windings, propelling the motor forward. These brushes over time can wear out and in some cases lead to inefficiencies since they're made of carbon. This is the same stuff resistors are made of. Modern motors have solved this problem by using precious metals or special compounds. One thing to note is servos are actually brush motors in disguise. They have a little control loop inside that makes them behave a little differently, but we'll get to that later. Moving on to stepper motors, these are typically found in CNC machines, 3D printers, and anything else that requires high positioning accuracy. Stepper motors have exceptional holding torque at the expense of higher RPMs. Stepper motors are not quite as easy to control as compared to a DC brush motor. They require an external driver, which are inexpensive and easy to come by. Now let's take a look inside of a stepper motor. As you can see, the coils are stationary and the magnet assembly is actually what spins. This is different from a brush motor because it has no brushes. What gives a stepper its name are these little grooves here. These are little teeth that redirect the magnetic fields to create a much smaller, what's called step distance. And this is what gives the motor exceptional holding torque. Moving on to brushless motors, they're a little bit different than stepper motors, but they share a lot of similarities. Both are spinning magnets versus the coils, but brushless motors have a much larger, what we would call step distance. Whereas stepper motors usually have 200 to 400 steps per revolution, brushless motors have between six, six and 12. The advantages of this are that they have a much higher operating RPM, but the disadvantage is that they have very low starting torque. They require very specialized controllers to optimize for the application of the user. With new controllers coming on the market, with the advent of quadcopters and ground vehicles, brushless motors are becoming more prevalent in robotics. So how do I choose the right motor for my application? When I need things to be positioned accurately or have a high holding torque, I look to the stepper motor. When I need things to move very fast, I look to the brushless motor. And for pretty much everything else, I look to the DC brush motor. Now in future videos, we'll show how to take a brush motor or a stepper motor and use it as a very precise positioning system. So let's talk about how to connect your motors to the other various Actobotics components. We've got four of the different motor mounts here. These mounts can actually be found on the website under robotics, mounts and hubs, and motor mounts. So there's a whole category just for the motor mounts. First up, we've got the motor mount A, which looks a little something like that. We've got the motor mount D, we've got the clamp mount, and we've got the clamping swivel mount. Let's start with the A. The A is good for connecting to the outside of channels like this. So first what we need to do is line up the holes with these two holes located on the face of the motor. This should be the same for the standard or the precision motors. I'm just going to use two screws. And there you go. Now we have a versatile mount that can mount to the outside of the Actobotics channels. So if we use a quarter inch screw, we can easily thread that through and attach this. So now we have a secure connection to the motor. Well, what if we want to mount on these inside open parts of the channel? We would want to use the motor mount D. This mounts very similar to this one, but mounts inside the channel like this. So it's always a good idea before you put this into the channel to get the shaft coupler attached to your output shaft, just so you don't have to go and reach inside and screw this later. Shaft couplers are basically these little metal tubes that have set screws in each side, and one shaft goes in one side, one shaft goes in the other side. You clamp them down and you can transfer the motion from the shaft of your 
motor to another shaft, or you could even attach a wheel on the other side. There's a lot of different types of shaft couplers, and they come in two bores. The first bore is the size of the inner hole on one side, and the other bore is the size of the other side. So now all we need to do is fit on our flanged bearing, and the flange will keep it from going inside the channel. There we go. We're going to use a plastic shaft spacer that will give a little bit of buffer in between that and our hub clamp, which we will then attach like this. So now that we have the hub on the end of here, we have a 0.77 inch hole pattern that we can use to attach any wheel that has a 0.77 inch hole pattern, or with the use of an adapter, we can actually adapt it to a larger wheel like this 1.5. Two more motor mounting options that we have are this motor clamp and also this swivel clamp. The motor mount is actually pretty simple and all we need to do is line it up with a 1.5 inch hole pattern like so, slide the motor in place, clamp down the set screw, and we've got a really simple way to mount a motor. The other benefit to this motor mount is that since the motor can actually slide inside and the motor output shaft is offset, it acts as an adjustment to adjust the motor up and down closer to or whatever you're trying to attach to. The swivel mount is very similar to this one except for it has a swiveling base. This base connects to the channel in the same way but with the aid of this screw it allows you to adjust the orientation of the motor any which way you want. So these two together along with the rotation inside the channel gives you a very flexible motor mounting solution. What if you have two shafts that are slightly misaligned? This is an example of a helical coupler. It just has these spiral cuts, which allows for angular misalignment. You might not be able to line up the shaft like this, but if you have any angular misalignment, that's exactly why you would use a helical coupler. A traditional shaft coupler is gonna be good for two shafts that are perfectly aligned. A helical coupler is gonna be good for shafts that have a little bit of angular misalignment, but what if you have a parallel offset? A parallel offset is where the two shafts are like this, but there's a bit of an offset between them. It's really difficult to transfer the motion in between these two shafts when they're offset like that. So the best way to deal with it would be to use some sort of gear, pulley, or belt system, and we'll be talking about those in later videos. Wheels are going to be the most common thing that people are going to attach to the end of a motor because it makes things drive, it makes things move, and it's pretty cool. I've got a few different types of wheels here, and the first thing that you'll notice is the actual width of the tread or the thing that touches the ground. We've got a big wheel here. This came off a Wild Thumper chassis. And then we've got one of these small wheels, which is an Actobotics Precision Disc Wheel. Now, why would you use this one over this one? A Precision Disc Wheel is going to have a much better time turning precisely, especially on a flat, smooth surface. Whereas something like this is going to take a lot more force to turn on a flat surface. This is not going to be a turning, handling type of wheel where this is. That being said, the really small profile of this wheel means that the overall weight of the robot is being spread out over a much smaller space. Whereas if you have a very heavy robot sitting on this, the weight is going to be spread out over a much larger surface area thus giving you a little bit more traction and also distributing the load a little bit better. But why would you choose something like a skate wheel, something like this, or maybe a larger wheel like these heavy duty wheels from Actobotics? These give you a little bit of the best of the both worlds. They have a very narrow profile as you can see, and this one has a little bit more, but they're also sturdy enough to handle a higher load. Now something to take into consideration with wheels is that you have the RPM of the output shaft but choosing two different size wheels is going to change how fast the robot can go. If we take the outer circumference of this wheel, one revolution can go, let's say, this far. But with this wheel, however, it might be like this far. So when designing a robot and designing the speed that you want it to go, or even trying to decide the RPM of the motor, you're going to have to consider the outer size of the wheel or the overall circumference of the wheel to determine how fast or how far it can go per revolution. The basic concept of angular motion is taking a motor and spinning something else. 
Now, in an ideal world, we just have a motor with some kind of wheel spinning at the end of it. The problem with that thinking is there's always going to be some sort of load exerted on that wheel or on that thing that's attached, so we're going to need bearings. There are several different types of bearings, and they all serve a little bit different purpose. But generally, a bearing is there to make sure that the motor spins smoothly and quietly. They take a lot of the load that is exerted against the output shaft of the motor. Some motors already have bearings in them, for instance, the stepper motor has a pretty sizable bearing in the output shaft, and it is good at taking loads against the side. So if you push against the side of the shaft, it can actually handle that pretty well. However, most motors do not have a bearing on the output shaft, so you'll need to provide one yourself. Join us next week for the third video in the robotic video series, which will be linear motion. Linear motion is a little bit different than angular motion in that we're interested in things moving on a linear plane rather than a rotational plane. So we'll see you again next week for linear motion.